Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Simon Dickinson. I'm a BIM technical manager for Greytech. Um, I've been using Revit now um, pretty much since Autodesk purchased um, the product back in sort of 2001. Um, Revit itself was actually first released in 1998. Obviously, back then it was purely um, an architectural tool. This has obviously developed into the structural tools which were first added, and then, of course, we've now got the M&E tools um, for the mechanical engineers in there as well. Okay. So, um, again, if I could just ask for a show of hands, is there anyone out there that is currently using Revit structures? Who's actually current, the current user? Cool. So we've got a got a few hands coming up. So there's going to there's going to be sort of some of this which is sort of um, quite obvious to some people, but it's quite a few of you. This is going to be um, brand new stuff that you, you've probably not seen before. Okay. So if we take Revit structure, um, it is a product that allows us to follow a, a BIM methodology. And again, um, for those of you that attended my webinar this morning, um, there'll be a bit of repetition here. Um, just to just so to fill everyone else in, so it is a BIM tool, and you know BIM's getting a lot of hype at the moment. So, so the idea of of building information modelling um, is very much out there in the forefront within our industry at the moment. Some people refer to BIM as building information management. Um, this leads on to the fact that the government are very excited about using this from a facilities management point of view, and the reuse of the data that we create. A construction phase and how we actually move that forward. So, um, if we think about BIM and and and, and our industry as a, as a whole and the way that we work, um, it's the way that we communicate that's going to be different within a BIM environment. It's how we actually can get our information and how we can sort of portray that information, how we can prototype buildings and get the information and the relevant information in a very clear and concise way to the people that need it. Okay. So one of the biggest advantages of BIM is the ability to collaborate. If Revit gives us one thing, it gives us, or BIM should I say, if BIM gives us one thing, it gives us a much easier way to communicate. It opens up communication paths um, and drives things forward. Um, it gives us the advantage so that we can actually take um, take on the new technologies and actually utilize these technologies for our benefit. Okay. So BIM is it's a model-based process. It's not working in 2D. Now, from a structural point of view, we've been working in 3D for quite a while because to actually understand our structures and to analyze them, it's always been easier to do it in 3D. So as far as the industry goes, um, from a structural point of view, the structural engineers were probably the first people to really start pushing the 3D um, boundaries of the software, so we can actually understand how our models would actually work. You know, is it going to actually support our building? How does everything then link together? You know, BIM will allow us to cooperate better. It allows us to virtually construct things as well. So moving further on beyond Revit to other products such as Navisworks that allow us to simulate the construction of our building. Um, as I mentioned, when we're actually using these intelligent 3D models for planning, design, and even building, you know, it, it's going to give us better clarity and understanding of how things are going to go together. When we look at the way that we collaborate with um, the architect and the M&E people and understand how these then situations can link and how we can communicate, um, we do get an understanding of how our steel work or structural model will actually sit within the overall scheme of things. It gives us continuity. And the biggest thing about um, continuity is if you're working in 2D, it's very much a disjointed method. So if you're working in plan and you start to make changes in the 2D environment, we've probably got to then remember to go and change elevation drawings as well. Because we're working in 3D, all our 2D views are representative of the central 3D model. So any change we make anywhere in the model is then represented everywhere. So we've got the continuity within there. Yeah, we've also got the agility because we're actually visually um, visually checking everything all the time. When a problem does arise, we're tending to find these problems before we get to site. 
So because of that, we can respond quicker to, to, to errors or to changes in design. The architect might make changes. The way that we then update them within Revit is very, very easy. Revit actually stands for revise instantly. It's where it gets its name from. So that tells you everything you need to know that it's all about being able to make the changes quickly with the continuity and the clarity. So we've got the consistency there. So a model-based design is definitely different to the way that we work in 2D. It's not the disjointed method where all these drawings get updated and m maybe we're not looking at the right drawing all the time. And it does give us um, the, the ability to move forward um, into this new idea of working in a BIM workflow. So it does deliver a lot more than what a 2D process would do. So for instance, automation of our design and construction documentation. Um, if anyone's ever had to do a rebar schedule from 2D drawings, it's a big, big job. Having to count up every single piece of rebar and hope that you haven't missed any, making sure the codes are correct and the shape codes are all consistent. It's an incredibly complex job. If we draw it, Revit will count it. So we can start to look at steel tonnage, we can look at column height. There's so much information we can pull directly out of the software just from the drawings. There's other functions in there. We've got the analysis side. So if you've got building design suite ultimate, that comes with robot structural analysis. So we can then take our model and we can then start to do analysis using robot. Even if you, you're using something else, say you're using CSE Fast Track, there's direct links. So we can take our Revit model, we can move it across to CSC. We can start to do the analysis there. Even if you've got Building Design Suite Premium, there is an al analysis tools to do um, structural analysis in the cloud with your subscription. Um, if you look on our website, there's a robot structural analysis webinar coming up, um, I believe, next week. We can also get our visualizations out of this. So if we want to actually create some nice realistic visualizations to see exactly how it's going to look so we can actually impress our clients, then we can start to do that as well. Now, the government um, a few years ago got very excited with regards to BIM. And they issued um, a, a, a construction strategy back in May 2011. The original sort of work was, was carried out around about 2007, 2008, when it first, this first started investigating BIM. Um, so they, they issued this document back in May 2011. Um, and it was to highlight the fact that by working in BIM, there was, there was savings to be made. And at that point, they then decided that all projects in excess of 50 million pounds would be done using a BIM methodology by 2016. They then readdressed that and thought, well, maybe 50 million is a bit extreme. This pure, surely there's going to be savings further down on the smaller projects. So we looked at it and they says, right, okay, let's go to 5 million. And then they thought, well, why not just look at it on a project by project? So now what we've said is that all government funded projects will be done using a BIM methodology. I'm sure there will be some leeway in that. If it's a, a, a quick refurb job of putting a couple of doors in, we're probably not going to redraw everything up in, in, in Revit or whichever other BIM package just to get that correct. Um, but by next year, all public funded projects are going to be going down that route. It was originally started by a gentleman called Paul Morell. He was the one who was first sort of um, employed as the government construction advisor um, at a time when the industry was sort of on its way down. We were just about to enter recession. Um, they realised that we, unfortunately, we work in sort of a very, very wasteful industry, um, and it was one of them situations where they were just like, "Well, how can we improve this? What we, what can we do to to make our industry more streamlined?" Um, and where can we actually save money? And this is where the BIM came in. So they basically looked at the different costs and, and where we could actually save time and save money. So they were looking at, they reckon that on a BIM project, we should be able to save 10% on the capital cost. We should be able to construct things 10% quicker. So predictability up by 20% so we can foresee problems. Um, if you can foresee a problem, you can fix it before you get there. 
defects, a reduction in defects on a building because we can try things out first. We can analyze things within the software um, in a virtual safe environment before we get to site. A 20% reduction in accidents. Because we've got construction sequencing here, we can start to plan our sites more efficiently. We can start to look at where equipment is, where we're storing uh, materials and start to understand exactly how our site works and we can definitely start to reduce the, the impact of accidents. With a lot of prefabrication happening now off-site, even on sort of like um, mechanical equipment, even down to sort of from the architectural point of view, that prefabrication again is going to help to reduce that. A 10% increase in productivity and then the biggest one there is the turnover and profits up 10% as well. So there's a benefit to everyone in here on the way that um, BIM works. Some of you may have seen this um, cheese wedge before and, and, and have seen the different levels. So there's four main levels of BIM, if you like. So you, you can almost forget level zero. Um, that's the old way of working. It's 2D drawings. These drawings could be done in CAD, but they could have also been done on a drawing board. Imagine just a 2D drawing board plan. If we're just sending a PDF out to someone of a CAD drawing, there's no interaction there. They can redline it in the, using a pen, scan it back to us. But that's just the old-fashioned way of working. It's very disjointed. If you look at level one, and level one's pretty much where most people that have started using um, BIM are at, it's we're utilizing the um, benefits of the 3D model. We've still got some 2D information in there as well, so we might have some 2D details that are in AutoCAD, etc. But we're not really um, sharing that data outside of our own organization. We're still transferring the drawings as static um, drawings, etc. As soon as we move to BIM level 2, which is where the government would like us to be by 2016, we're starting to share our 3D data. And we're starting to utilize that 3D data so that we can look for the coordination of all that data, the data we understand how it then links together, etc. And then we can move across to BIM level 3. Some people will claim to be BIM level 3 compliant at the moment. BIM level 3 standard has not been set. There are certain concepts of BIM Level 3 which the software does not exist to allow for. So at the moment we want to collaborate at Level 2, we will send our 3D model off, the architect will send his 3D model off, off to the structural engineer and vice versa. But you've then got a static version of the architect's model. The architect's still developing that model back in the office, you've just got a copy that he sent you last week. So that data's technically already out of date. One of the concepts of BIM Level 3 is the fact that we're going to be working in the cloud. So if I make a change to my architectural model, the structural engineer is going to see that straight away. And as a structural engineer, if I make a change to where the steelwork is, the architect is going to be able to see that instantly as well. So you're going to get live update data. So it all has to work in the cloud. The moment that doesn't work. Um, there's still protocols in the way that we transfer files between each other. So not everyone's going to be using Revit. There's, there's a quite a few um, people out there using Revit and it's actually the chosen product now within the BIM sort of community. But there's other products. We've got Tecla, we've got StuCat, you may be using them as well. There may be other architectural packages, you may be using Revit um, structure but you might be dealing with an architect that's using Archicad. So we've got file formats to be able to translate that. Um, in particular, there's one called IFC. So you can see IFC is actually mentioned there as a BIM Level 3 object. At the moment, that's a translator. So it will translate our drawings to um, an IFC, and then we can open the IFC in another package, and then that package will translate the IFC into its own style. So if we load up and open up an IFC, it will create an RVT file within Revit for us from the IFC, but it's translating that information. Okay, so by 2016, we need to be hitting BIM level 2 um, if we're working on public funded projects. And I believe the it's the 1st of April that we're planning on going live, so or the 4th of April, whichever the first day of the tax year is. So, Quickly, for those of you that are already using um, Revit Structure, um, just a, 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 a quick update on some of the new functionality that we've added into 2016. Um, so they, they do this every year. One of the things that goes in, into Revit every year is improvements to the rebar tools. Now, for those of you that may not be aware, Greytech um, sold 
two products to Autodesk um, just over 12 months ago. So we had a product called Advanced Steel and another product called Advanced Concrete. They are now Autodesk products. The links between Revit and Advanced Steel are very, very good. There's a plugin which allows for integration between the two products. So Advanced Steel is a steel detailing package. Yeah, Some of you that have used Revit structure in the past may be aware that there used to be an AutoCAD structural detailing package um, that would allow you to do your connection detailing. That's now gone. That doesn't exist anymore. Advanced Concrete, some of the features from Advanced Concrete are now integrated into Revit. So the functionality from that package is being integrated. And some of that is the way in which the reinforcement works. And every year, year on year, reinforcement gets better. Okay, so I'll show you some of the way that reinforcement works. But we've got improvement in here for the constraints on our rebar. We've also got the ability to create rebar shapes for path reinforcement. It's always been good. But as path reinforcement, so the edge edge reinforcement, if you like, has always been a little bit awkward. Again, it just helps um, increase that, especially when it looks it comes to looking at how that's actually looking and, and, and referring it to to a 3D view as well. The other thing we had as well is we reinforcement always wanted to be perpendicular, so it could be vertical or horizontal. But if you've got a, a retaining wall like we've actually got here in this slide, um, and I actually want to be able to rotate that to match the cover setting, then I can do so. I can now use the shift key to actually rotate um, my rebar while editing to actually get that to actually fit it the way I want it to fit. We've also got the ability to in increase and control the rebar lens better. Um, so we can actually work out what the best length is, especially when it comes to overlaps based on the length of, of, of a piece of rebar. We've had improvement to our scheduling as well. So we've now got the ability to put a host mark in. So before, if we did a schedule of all the reinforcement, it just gives us a schedule of every piece of rebar that we had in our entire project. Now we can actually link that to the host object. So we can basically give each column a mark, and then that column can report back what column it is, and all the reinforcement that's actually just associated to that column. On a large project, you're probably going to have a lot of rebar. As soon as you start to rotate your views, it's going to start getting um, a little bit. You, your machine's going to start to struggle a little bit at this point. So as you're starting to rotate everything around, it's going to try and display everything. What we'll get now is it will stop displaying the rebar whilst you rotate it around and then it will redraw. So it's a lot quicker. And there are other things within Revit 2016 to help with the, the redraw enhancements as well. Um, we've got a new structural um, section as well. So we can actually now start to put the structural section through. And we've got better control over what's displayed in that section. Again, much easier way to use. Uh, we've also got some new shape types in there as well for both cold form and, and concrete as well. Um, they're always changing the standards and we're always making sure that we've, we've actually got libraries in here that support what we need. Um, so we've added in here BS5950-1 um, um, as a standard. Um, and every year they seem to be improving the, the, the standard and classification of the components that are actually in our libraries. Some structural load improvements, because at the end of the day, we might need to load up our models before we can take them off to be an, uh, analyzed. So there is a full analy analytical model which sits in the background um, on Revit uh, that we can then use when we export. That's the information that um, Robot will use and, and the other an analysis packages as well. So we can even put our loads on there, um, static loads, wind loads, snow loads, um, and, and the others, et cetera, It'll pretty much any load you can set up. We've also got the ability to have combined loads as well. Um, the member force and connection. So the, we can now create our families to understand how the, um, the moments work. So we can actually set the end um, forces to, to rotate in, in the correct direction. So we can have a good understanding of where um, the forces are going to impact. And we also have the ability to switch the direction of the beams as well um, to make sure that the start and end directions are correct for our analytical software as well. Um, finally, as well, we've got some um, new analysis types in there as well. So we've actually got a new analysis type for gravity, um, which we can set up as well. 
Um, I did get asked if you could change the value of gravity. Um, I've got a feeling some people were maybe considering building, um, putting buildings on a, a different planet that might have slightly different gravity um, settings. In this case, no, that's not the case. Okay, so let's actually have a look um, at Revit structure and, and, and how it works and also the, the, the workflows that we can actually use to actually collaborate with an architect actually on a project. So I've got um, Revit open here. Now, this is um, affectionately known as Revit One Box. So if you've got a building design suite, it will come with Revit One Box. Revit One Box has got all the architectural tools in, it's got all the structural tools in, and it's got all the um, system tools in as well. If you're just running Revit Structure, you'll get some architectural, all the structural, but you'll get none of the system tools. So this just gives us the best of both worlds. We can draw anything we want in here. So I've got my structural tools here for being able to draw beams, structural walls, columns, etc. All my floors, we've got beam systems. We've got all our, um, our foundation tools, a whole host of reinforcement tools, some opening tools, the datums that we're going to work to, so levels and grids. Okay. So um, just to draw a, a really simple sort of structure, um, let's pop some grids in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create um, an array of grids. I'm not really paying too much attention about the spacing of where I'm actually setting these up. Um, so I can just draw these across and you'll notice that I've not been mega accurate. That's 5 200, that's 5 meters. Um, I can use one of my dimensions to dimension these grids. I've got a little EQ button there. If I hit EQ, I get this EQ marker and I know that the spacing between each of these grids is identical. Let's just go back to our grid tool. So that's grids 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I want this one to be grid A. It's numbered it as 6. I'm going to set that to A. Whatever I set this to, the next object that I draw, so I'll just right click, create similar, and that will become B. And it will sequence on. If I named um, a grid line one of these over here to maybe 4A, the next grid I drew would be 4B. Okay, so it's just it's just trying to help me organize the way that these grids are working. Okay, and I'm going to leave them misspaced as well. So five meters between them. So it's quite quite a large area. Notice I've got levels over here, so it's saying level one, level two. If I just go to my south elevation, here's the grids that I've just been drawing in, look. And here's now level one, level two. Whenever we create anything in Revit, it will be associated to a level. Um, and it just means that this helps scheduling later and we can then work out where certain items are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put another level in. Okay. And I can select it. I can use these dimensions. We refer to these as listening dimensions. I can set that to, to three meters. Okay. And then if I go to level three, there's my grids. Just a word of warning. If I now put another level in, and this is this is a design feature of the software, and we'll set that to three meters. Notice it's um, above. It's actually above my um, grids, which means if I now go to level four, I've got no grids. Okay. This means that if the building got smaller towards the top and I only wanted half of my grids to appear on that level, I can do. So it just allows me to tidy things up. Okay. In reality, I'm actually just going to pull them up, and I just need to go to a west ele another the west elevation. These are three dimensional of these grids, so they do pass through from the west to the east. So once you've done one. You only have to do the opposing um, opposing grids. The levels I've just done that for the sake of making that look correct. So now what I can do is notice I've got no analytical. The analytical is simply a copy of the normal level with everything switched off except the analytical model. And I'll come on to how that works in a second. So I'm going to go to level four. Here's my grids. And let's now put some columns in. So I'm going to go to column. And here we have various columns that are currently loaded into my project. So I've got some universal beams. Technically, they are columns, universal beam stroke columns. Look, 
if I come up to here, I can load additional steel sizes, concrete, etc. So I can come down here, I can go to my structural columns. Um, I want steel. And in here, look, we've got the Chorus Advanced. I've got the British Standards ones in here, look. So I've actually got a universal column. If I actually go into there, the sizes will be UK um, standard sizes. Okay. So I'm a width and a height, flange thickness. Or I could come in, got my structural columns, steel, there's my chorus advance, yeah, and then my UKB, and then I've got all the, the chorus sizes. I don't have to load every single size in, I can just load the sizes in that I decide, click OK, and that's now added in as well, these UKB sizes. Look. I then can have this on the end of my cursor and I can start to decide where I want this to go. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to say that this column it goes from level 4. We always work downwards in Revit, so from level 4 depth down to level 1. Um, the idea behind this is making sure that we understand that we're trying to keep the top of the building where it needs to be. And obviously, depending on how the building is, it depends on how strong the structure needs to be at the bottom. So we can actually increase the strength of our information as we go down. I've got the ability here to place up columns, so I can actually select all them. It's actually placed the columns in. If I hit the space bar, before I hit the finish button up here at the top, I can actually rotate the direction of these columns. So I'm just going to do that. I'm going to hit finish. Okay. So that is now placed in, if we have a look in 3D, my columns. Yeah. So I'm going to go down to my level 2. And just as I place my columns in using this automated method, now notice that that column just looks as a line work. This is down to my detail level. If I go to a medium level of detail, it's very square. If I want it to look really nice and go to a fine level of detail, it'll also then start to put the fillix in as well. Okay. So quite nice. It looks, it, it looks the part now. But I now want to go and put my beams in. I can do the beams in exactly the same method as I did with the columns. So I can zoom out, go on grid, and I can place all the beams in there. Okay. So that's now placed my beams in. If we look here, it's only placed them in on the level that I drew them, level two. I also want them to be on level three and level four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select everything. Now, obviously, these elements in there I don't want. We've got a filter command here, which allows us to filter out elements we don't want. In this case, I actually am only interested in the fr framing entities, so these 40 beams. Okay. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to copy these to my clipboard. Okay. So they're now copied. And if I just go to modify here, I can now paste aligned by selected levels. So all them elements that are on there, I want them to also appear on level 3 and level 4. If I click OK, that will copy them up. Yeah. So that's now basically gone through. If I just go shaded, yeah, and placed the elements on the levels that I want. If we go back to level two, there's other things I can now do. So maybe I actually want some beam systems in here as well. So I actually want to start putting the beam systems in ready to support the, the floors and the decking, etc. So there's various tools. So if we can draw beams, we can draw walls. So I can actually start to draw structural walls in here as well. We've got the floors, various trusts. We can start to put our bracing in as well. But I've also got a beam system. So by default, I'm in automatic. Yeah. So I don't, this is this is the easiest way to put a beam system in my building. I can specify the beam I want to use. The justification. I can then specify the distance between each of them. So this is a fixed distance of 18. Yeah. 18 to 8.8. It's a bit of a strange number because it's actually just converted it from the um, imperial size, but we can change that. As I come over and I set the, um, let's actually change that to say, I want one of them every 15, every 1200. Okay. Just so you can see this. As I then hover over the, the beam, which is going to be the beam direction, it will automatically place that in based around the justification of the center. Yeah. I could go from the beginning. So it'll always then start at the beginning each time. 
so I can then start and I can come in here and I can start to put my beam systems in. And we can go through and I can keep putting them in. Okay. And as you can see, we're now starting to get our steel in there. Now, I've got no bracing in here at the moment. So it may be that I actually want to have some, some bracing on this model. Now, where you've ever you've got a grid line, we have actually got in here some elevation. So I can go to an elevation and I can see how that works. The problem is the software currently doesn't know what I'm actually looking at as far as putting my bracing in. So I can't really, in the Z value, I don't know if I'm working on the first grid I get to or the second grid. So what we have is we actually have a tool under view where I can put a particular elevation in. So I can go to elevation, I can go to my framing elevation, and this elevation will only work when I hover over a grid line. Yeah? So if I hover over that grid line, it will place an elevation in there. And that elevation is locked to that grid line. So when I come into here now, what we're looking at is not just that first bay, but we're actually going to be able to work directly on that bay as well. I can go to structure, I can go to brace, I can specify the type of bracing that I actually want in there, and I can then put the bracing in, okay? And it will stick that in the angle and where I need it to be. What it also does as well is if I actually go to, to this view and I just set this to a course level of detail, it's actually put the dashed line in as well to show me that I've actually got brace in there. If you don't like the dashed line, if I just go to this setting here, to my um, structural settings from this little drop down, I can actually start to say, is it a parallel line? Do I want a line with an angle? So I've changed to a line with an angle look, and it will show me where that's actually coming from. So it, it's up to you how you actually want the annotation to display. It's customizable, and we can actually set that up. So we've now started to, to set this up. Um, it may be that I need to put foundations on. So I'm going to come into here, um, isolated foundations. So I've got some rectangular foundations. And again, I can load additional families in here. So if I go to my structural foundations, um, we've actually got some pile caps in here. So these are just pile caps. Or I can actually load the pile caps with the piles in. So if I wanted a four pile cap. I can put this in. The depth of the piles is just purely symbolic. Um, the way that that work, that, that they're set up, obviously we don't know until we get to site and, and analyze the actual ground itself. Again, just as I did with the um, beams, I can actually go at grids. So I can actually specify all the grids. I can hit finish. And it's automatically now placed all the piles in there. Okay. So very quickly, I'm now starting to get my portal frame set up. If I just go visibility graphics, and I'm just going to turn off all my model categories. Yeah. Underneath there, and we couldn't see this to start with, is you can see that I've actually got my analytical model. Yeah. So this is the model that I can send out to be analysed. I've got a start and end point. Yeah. So what I can actually do. I just turn back on my model elements. If I actually select an object, yeah, one of the options I've got if I right click on it, on the, if I go to that one, let's do it on that one, yeah, is to flip the structural frame ends, yeah. I'd actually selected the wrong element to start with there, but we can actually change. So at the moment, if I just click in there, we can actually see the start points here at this point. Right click. If I flip that, it's now flipped that. That's actually one of the new features within 2016, which is very useful if you're starting to analyze things. Because it always goes in the direction you've drawn it. And it may be that you've drawn it in the wrong direction. Now, there's a couple of really cool um, features within the beam system, which um, I didn't show you. So I'm just going to um, come over to here. I can select this column. And I'm going to put a top offset in here. So I'm going to put a one meter. Um, top offset, yeah. So that column now goes up to one meter. If I select this beam at the end, I can actually start to put offsets on the ends of the beams as well. So it's a bit hard to see because it's just under there. If I just go hidden line. We actually have a value there that we can actually change to actually put the offsets in. So 
the one thing that you shouldn't do is in here this topic top level is level four um, some people will start to not so much on columns because columns have to have a, a top um, level but on a wall you can actually change this to unconnected so we'll actually have a rather than having this going up to the level four it'll start the ground floor and it'll simply have um, a 12 meter height um, the problem you get there is one of the top features here is I might have started this drawing with very little understanding of what the what the top of steel distances are it's completely irrelevant because if I come back in here now and I say well actually that's that one's 3.2 meters it's automatically updated it because everything's related to a level even here where I've put this one meter offset so if I then change the top level to be 10 meters that will move that up oops it helps if you type um, 10 meters and not a thousand let's just undo that and uh, just simply put 10 in there it's in meters not millimeters yeah and then we can just move that up just to move our annotation out of the way so I can actually adjust one value and my entire model is updated okay I might need to reanalyze it just to make sure that the columns are going to be strong enough now to support that height but um, that bit's done for me now if we go back to this bit here this is obviously um, an uneven form to have um, a beam system on but Revit doesn't matter it doesn't really worry about that so what I can do is this particular corner uh, when I find which corner I actually drew it in okay I don't know what orientation here we go so it's in this corner here notice when I click on this as well I'm getting an arrow now the arrow is indicating that that beam is not flat so it's indicating the um, the direction of my analytical model so that's again back to the feature where in here I haven't got the analytical switched on yeah so I can show the analytical if you haven't got it on you can still see because that's in there as well okay I can now put a beam system in there and we can actually create what's called a 3d beam system yeah so I've actually got a, a 3d button here yeah and it means that if I go into sketch rather than auto I can choose my supports and I can choose the beams so I can actually now come in and specify this yeah the arrow here indicates that this is sloping yeah so it knows that the beams are going to be coming away from me are going to be sloping there's my beam direction so it's going to run parallel to, to this point here if I didn't want that I can come to the top and I can change the beam system the, the beam direction by default it will automatically choose the, the direction will be the first object that you select will predefine the um, the beam direction I can hit finish and it's placed them in there okay notice in here as well because I told it to I'm actually tagged everything as well um, if you wanted everything else tagged then we can use our annotate tag all that are not tagged choose my structural framing click OK and it will then tag everything else in that view as well but more importantly if I go to my 3d view now that has actually created this beam system on a very awkward slope very good for putting purlins in as well because we could have actually set a, a, an offset in here to actually raise them up so they're not at the, the um, same height as the main beams and we can actually use it to place our purlins on, on the top as well okay um, so, so that's drawing in our, our steel structure um, anywhere where you've got um, a concrete object as well as long as it's set up as a structural concrete element we can automatically then get access to um, the rebar yeah so I can come into here I can select this object and I can start to put reinforcement in here yeah now the one thing that we used to have before which was always awkward is you used to have to have a, a section in here to be able to to create the reinforcement now we don't now we can actually start to to put reinforcement in without a section um, we in most cases as well the pile cap slightly different but if you've got beams in there we don't need to be in section and we can then start to put our reinforcement in um, all our standard codes yeah are listed in here as well um, so we can actually specify the codes that we want to use all the way through to loops etc yeah so whichever 
code you want to use we can set up so there's various different things we can do within um, reinforcement I'm not going to go into all the reinforcement tools that we've actually got um, so we've got single options multiple arrays yeah so if I actually start a new quickly start a new project and just give you a quick example of how the reinforcement works so let's um, put in here um, a structural column so I've got some there we go let's just maneuver that let's just delete that and create similar then we can go and put our beam in there yeah, even though I'm drawing between the midpoints it will actually it knows to actually draw it just to the size that I want but if I actually just quickly put a section in there so here's our, our section for this beam I can go to reinforcement okay and you'll notice now as I move inside the the beam it will not let me put it outside the cover so as I move in the green dashed line is the cover setting so every object we can predefine what our cover distances are um, and that's what's coming in here so I'm actually placing this perpendicular to cover um, let's actually just go to put some stirrups in yes yeah, so let's put a 63 in there don't want it perpendicular no, I actually want it um, parallel yeah then I can set over here single I want a fixed number I want a maximum spacing so I want a maximum spacing of 150 mil and I can place that in there yeah um, I could then go back to my shape code zero yeah again perpendicular to cover and I can say maximum spacing yeah or a fixed number so I actually want three Oops. Wait till I accept that. Yeah. And then as you can see I can then place them in there as well. Okay. So I can very easily oh I could just say let's just go to zero up to one. Yeah. I've got a single entity in there and I can start to place single bars where I want it. Now more importantly, if we just have a look at what I've got in three D here. Yeah, we can actually see the reinforcement in there and the level of detail that we can actually get that to if I just select just a reinforcement over here we actually have the visibility state in 3D I want it to show unobscured and solid and if I just go shaded now look we can actually start to see how our reinforcements actually working and if I actually just come down to my schedules and quantities it's actually a rebar schedule already set up in the default template and here is my um, reinforcement template set up with the quantities the bar length etc the shape codes that are being used as well so all that information is already predefined so I've now got a a, a, a starting point for all the reinforcement within this model as well so that's sort of the basics of how we can start to work very quickly within within the software but the scenario is um, I've actually got a model that the architect sent me and I want to start to be able to coordinate and work with the architect now there's some various tools within um, Revit that actually allow to facilitate this so let's start a new project okay and what I just need to do is make sure I know where this file saved to I think I do um, boom, boom, boom. I'll just do a save as on this project so that I know exactly where I'm working and let's just stick that on my desktop okay so that's the architects file sorted now the architect may have done various things within Revit there's there's three main coordinate systems there's a shared coordinates um, there's the internal coordinates and then there's the project coordinates. So project coordinates are what allow us to work in simple terms as in perpendicular it means that if I go to an elevation the ground floor is at zero but in reality the architect may have already positioned this building using 
um, OS coordinates. Um, it may be rotated so that True North is set up. So if I come over to my to this view here, currently this is Project North. If I go True North, that is the actual orientation of a building that it's being reconstructed in. Now it's useful for me to better know that, and also how I then have the same coordinate system in my model. It's a bit like starting out in AutoCAD, you start to draw something, but the architect's got his 00 in a slightly different place. It's very hard then to get the XREFs to actually meet. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set that back to Project North. Go back to here, and I'm going to insert my um, Revit file. So I can go insert that link. Desktop, let's just find there's the office block. And positioning, auto origin to origin center to center or by shared coordinates. Now, we want to use the shared coordinates that the architects use, but currently they're not shared. The architect's got them, I haven't. So that's not sharing. That's he's got them, I want them. Um, so I now need to decide which is the best of the other two. So is it center to center, origin to origin? Both of them will work fine, but personally, and what we would always recommend is you go origin to origin. Center of, the center of a model will change as the model gets bigger. So if you start to build additional information to one side of the model, the center is basically the geometric center of all the geometries. If you draw a circle that just encapsulates all the geometry on that project, then the center of the circle is going to be the center center. So I'm going to choose origin to origin in this case, and I'm going to click open. Yeah, so this is just going to load this model in. It's going to look a bit strange because if I actually go to 3D, it'll look even more bizarre. Yeah, because it's only showing me the, the, the model at a view discipline for structural. And also, if I go VG, which is visibility graphics, so this is like my layer control. So in AutoCAD, we've got layers. In Revit, we've got categories. And you notice a lot of the categories are switched off because I don't need to see doors and etc. So I can switch these on, and we can make it look exactly the same, um, give it the same view as what the architect's getting. Um, but in reality, I want this. So we've got some flaws in here. We've got some columns. OK. Um, if I just go to my site view, this is now the, the site view of this model. If I now change this orientation to true north, nothing happens. Because currently, of course, we're not sharing the coordinates. So I know the coordinates are set up in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Manage. And I'm going to go to Location, and then my coordinates in here, look. And I'm going to acquire the coordinates from the linked file. So my model now is set up to the exact same coordinate system that the architect is set up. So I'm just going to set that back to Project North. The second thing I might want to do is, the architect's already drawn some um, levels in there. Um, if I also come to here, he's also drawn, he's drawn the grids in there, sorry, and he's also drawn the levels in. Yeah, so I can utilize these. So we have a whole series of tools under Copy Monitor, under um, Collaborate, called Copy Monitor. And this is going to allow me to utilize the XREF. Um, I'm just going to copy out of there, the XREF, but more importantly, the keyword is in the monitor. It's going to monitor the, the, the relative location of the objects. Therefore, if the architect starts to move these elements, I'm going to be aware of it. Okay, so it's going to let me know what's going on. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to come to the 3D view. I, in fact, it doesn't really matter which view I'm going to start with. I'm going to go to Copy Monitor. I'm going to select the link I want to use, which is this one. And now I can look at the options. So it's not going to let me copy every single element within the architects, but it's going to let me copy the references and the guides that I need. So things like the levels, the grids, the columns, the walls, and the floors. So there's various different options. So on the levels, um, the architect's working at a finished floor level. I want to work to top of steel. Um, I've got I'm probably going to put 300 mil floors in here, so I'm going to set my levels up at minus 300. So my top of steel will come up to the underside of the floors. Okay. Um, reuse levels with the same name. Yeah, it's fine. Um, add a suffix or a prefix. Yeah. So I can basically say that um, I want all my levels to have a hyphen S at the end, so that I know that even though it's going to call it um, ground floor, it's going to have an S on the end, so I know it's mine and not the architect's. Same with the grids. I can come into here, and I can basically let's put prefix of S hyphen on there. 
I can choose to copy the columns and it will just randomly place any old column. It's just chosen the default column in here. So even where I've got a circular hollow section, one from the architects, I don't need to worry about that. I can just put my own in. It, it's me saying that I want to put my own steels in because we don't really know what they're going to be yet. Or what I can also do is where the circular hollow section is, I can say, right, that's fine. Do I actually have that circular hollow section size? So the 168. Ooh, I've got oh, close, but I haven't quite got it. I've got a 1683B10, but not the 3 before. So what I can do is I can say, right, okay, copy the original type. This will copy the type and that family out of the architects. And I can do the same for this, this one as well. So we'll say, right, copy the original. These rectangular um, columns, they're loaded into the architects file, but they're not actually in use. There's no concrete columns in there. But I could say copy original, copy the AMO cross as well. The walls I could just leave as generic 200 because I'm not really too fussed about them. And I could do the same with the floors. So it's going to copy the floors across um, as 300. So we'll click OK. Now what I need to do is I need to copy these elements. Yeah. And I can go copy. I want to copy multiple. So we'll go copy multiple elements. So I don't want to do one at a time. And I'm just going to select the grids. Okay. It says, if you're pressing the right key, I can now go finish. And you'll see um, one should appear on there. Another new grid with S-1. And if I just step that out, you'll notice just it looks now like there's two grids in there. One of them's in the XREF, one of them's now my grid that I can actually utilize as well. Okay. Also, if I just select that, you'll notice there's like a, a little heartbeat monitor just showing there. That's showing that that element, the location of that element is being monitored by the software. So that's my um, grids done. Let's come into here, copy, multiple. Do the levels, hit finish, should see them all come in and we should all be stepped down by 300 mil, which they are. And then I can go to my 3D view and I can copy the remaining elements in the model. So I'm going to copy the floors um, and the columns and basically the building elements. So we'll just hit finish. There's probably an element that's the same size type in here already, so it's just going to rename the, it's, the, it's the fact that it's called circular hollow section as a family that it's, it's just renaming that and we've got lots of monitors now to show what's being monitored more importantly if I just go to visibility graphics go to my link so this is my xrest if you like I can turn off the architect's link you know you'll see it disappear because the, the cubicles that I've actually got visible at the moment will disappear yeah so each one of these now is my floor I can edit the boundary of it and I can modify everything in here so what we're currently looking at is now the starting point for my my building. Yeah, so my structural model that I can start putting together. Just going to hit finish on here, and I can then now start to create other elements. So I'm going to go to beam. Um, one of the nice features I've got under here is notice I haven't created all my levels yet, but I can actually use 3D snapping on these beams, and I can actually snap directly to the top of these existing columns okay so even where we've got a slope in here I can actually it helps if you actually snap to the right place I get this 3d snap and it will start to place these in okay so I can now start working on this building and I can start doing some work but as I mentioned before this is a, like a static process the, the information I've got from the architect is, is now slowly becoming out of date because um, the architect's probably still back in his model working away. So it might go, um, let's just move this door a bit closer to the fire exit so that if we do need to evacuate, everyone can go that way. That's fine. So we can move that. Um, it might also do something that where he's lent on this grid line and he's accidentally knocked it. Yeah, it was very hard to see there that I've knocked it, but you can actually see now where this column's intersecting the wall. So he's basically made some changes. Some of them on purpose, some of them by accident. He issues this drawing to me, and I get a, a, a message to say, "Oh, by the way, we've got some. There's an updated version of the file." So I can go to my manage links on insert. I can select the the architect's file, and I can reload it. 
if he sent me a file and it's got a different name, so it's now called revision three, or there's some naming change, I can do a reload from. Underneath the bonnet, Revit assigns a serial number to everything, including the file. Therefore, when Revit reads the file, regardless of what the name is being changed to, it will know it's the same file. And it will know to, to check the items that I'm monitoring against their serial number. If it's been deleted, it will know, and it will warn me that that element's been deleted. If it's moved, it will know, and it will warn me. So if I now go OK, it should tell me that that file Let's just do a make sure that I think I did a make sure that that's file save as project. Make sure it's on my desktop. It is let's save that. So if I now do select reload, make sure it's using the correct file. That one, okay. There we go. So. It's warning me that the instance of the link file needs a coordination review. So let's click OK, come out of that window. So it now knows something's changed, yeah? In fact, if I just go to VG and turn back on the link, yeah, we can now see, if I, as that's my wall, we can now see where the opening's moved to, okay? Which is all well and good if you know where the changes are. Because I don't, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to Collaborate. I'm going to go Coordination View. I'm going to select the link. This is a list of all the changes that have been made and all the information that's updated. So I've actually got a rectangular opening yeah, that's moved. Yeah, so this and this. So I can go, right, show me where that door is. And I can keep it in show and eventually it will find yeah it goes through the, the views that are open but eventually it will find the best view so we can actually see look there's the difference and it now gives me an option so it now says okay what do you want to do about this what do you want to do about this change do you want to postpone it i.e. I ain't got time to look at that at the moment I need to get something else done that will mean that the next time I run a coordination review, that will be still listed as an issue. I can reject it, which will basically, it, it just completely says, right, you're rejecting that. It will leave it there and mark it as rejected. You can accept the difference. Now, imagine they've moved an object, but it doesn't affect what you're doing. So if they've moved an internal partition wall, but it's not going to affect anything structural, you can accept the difference. But the smart thing is, even if you accept the difference, what Revit will do is, it will go, OK, so you've accepted the difference, but I will now monitor its new location compared to its old location. So it will still carry on monitoring it, you're just saying you're quite happy with the discrepancy within your model. What I can also do is I can now also say, well, OK, that's fine. I can understand what is going on there. I need to move that because this is a structural wall. I might need to change where the lintels are. I might change where the reinforcement is. I can then go apply. That has now updated that. The problem has now disappeared. The same thing here as well. So we've got a grid and a column. These are all linked together. So if I actually came in, I'm actually going to tell it to just do the move, yeah? If I move this, we should all disappear because the column then will have moved into the same place because it's linked to the grid. Move a column, it moves a grid, yeah? So I'm now using the architect's model to drive this forward, okay? I could create all the views in here, so I can come in and I can say plan view. Let's create the, the structural plans for these levels, yeah? So... It will now create these structural plans look. I can then start to look further into this. So I could come to the first floor, and we can start to put all our structural elements in here. I could start to put my beam systems in, add in the other beams, etc. And let's just quickly add some extra detail into our model. Be careful with 3D snapping, because it wants to snap to the top of the columns. Um, if you're in 3D snapping, you've had that on, beware, it might not be snapping to where you think it's snapping. Okay, so we can then, in section to in section, yeah. And we can start to place these elements in there, okay. 
if I go to my 3D view, let's just go VG again, turn off. Okay, but we can start seeing now where I'm putting my additional steel in and also where we've got these beams here as well. So I can now round trip because what I can do is I can now send this back um, to the architect. So I'm just going to do a save and we'll save this to my desktop. This is our structure. Let's see if you can type. Let's call it struct for circuit speed. And if I now go back to here, I've just got the 3D view. So I've now been told, let's just right click and hide the roof. I've been told that the structure engineer sent the file through. It's on my server. I can now go insert. I'm going to link a Revit file, and the Revit file I want is now the structural one. Now, where it says, what's my positioning? I can say by shared coordinates, because, of course, I acquired the coordinates from the architect when I was drawing my model. So, therefore, we know that we're, we were sharing the same coordinate system. So, I'm going to specify that now as shared coordinates. I'll click open, and fingers crossed, if it all works right, it will come in exactly where it needs to be. And it has indeed. So, we've now got this information pulled in. Yeah. Now, I mentioned that um, on the Collaborate, it was called copy slash monitor. If you copy it, it automatically monitors it. But sometimes you might just want to monitor an element that someone else has set up, but you don't actually want to copy it. So for instance, if I come back here and as a structural engineer, what I want to do is, I'm actually going to add an extra level in here, because what I want is, I actually want um, a level for um, the parapet wall. We're going to put a parapet wall on here, um, and this is going to be the top of my parapet wall. Okay, So this is where this new level comes in. So I'm going to hit save. Go back to being my structural engineer to the architect's model. And I'm going to come into here and I'm going to reload. Okay. If I now go to one of my elevations, yeah, if I look at the top here, I should now have this new level that the architect's putting, uh, that the structural engineer's putting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to collaborate, copy monitor, select the link. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to use copy. I'm just going to use monitor. And it will now say, OK, so pick an element to monitor. And I'm going to use my level here. So it needs to be a, an object in my project. And I'm going to monitor the relative location between my roof level and the structure's new level that he's placed in. OK? So it's automatically called it roof T because it's 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 automatically sequencing from the last character. But I have now monitored, yeah, this the location of this object. Which means if I now change that value here, because it's a bit of a funny value is that, so let's go 12.5 and save. So as I'm now monitoring elements in the architect's model, the architect can also monitor, there we go, coordination review. And it should tell me when I go to collaborate, coordination review, select the link, that that level's moved. Yeah, and it's moved by 105 mil. So this is now round tripping. So this is true collaboration. Not only are we using the architect's model to actually create our structural file, but the architect is also able to do the same thing in reverse. So we can actually then start to monitor certain elements within within our structural model as well. So Revit Structure is an incredible, powerful tool. Uh, we haven't gone into all the features um, this afternoon on, on what it can do. So the one thing that I didn't touch on is when we go to the analysis and we start to look at our loads. So where we can actually start to put in our different load cases, where we've got our combined loads, etc. All of this then can be added in so that we can then start to analyze this building. Okay. Revit structure linked together with the other products is a very powerful design tool. The analysis side of it is, again, something that's very powerful. We are running a completely separate webinar on um, 
the structural analysis tools. So if you're interested in structural analysis, please do sign up for that. Um, it's again, if you have a look on our website or on the email that you received about our summer, summer, summer webinars, you'll actually find it on that. Hopefully that's been a really good insight into the way that Revit Structures works. Um, if you have got any questions, do fill them out on the form and I will do my best to get back to you um, later on today. Again, thank you all very much for your time this afternoon and I hope it's been useful. Thank you very much.